Okay, I'll, I'll try to condense the first part of, you know, the history of hang glider design, but it's, I mean, when we think of hang glider design now, we think of, you know, the 70s and after. But really, hang gliding has been around for a long time. I mean, there's Chanute, there's Lilienthal, and in, in the 1920s, my, my uncle, my, my great uncle, um, flew foot launch gliders, and on the back of the photo of him flying these foot launch gliders, it says Wilson flying a hang glider. Um, so it's been around for a long time. But really what, you know, what, what kicked off modern hang gliders is the 1971 Lilienthal meet where, you know, hang gliding hit the media and attracted these thousands of people into hang gliding. Um, and the, the progress in the development of hang gliding, um, hang glider equipment in performance, in safety, in technology between 1971 to 1974 where it became really mainstream and there were you know, thousands and thousands of people in, involved to um, you know, 10 or 15 years later was extraordinary. Um, hang glider models, new hang glider models lasted as little as six months, maybe a year before something else would be released. And, um, and that's because there were so many people involved, so many companies involved and um, the pace of the development was just extraordinary and completely unlike what it is today. Um, imagine that um, right now in the United States there's two hang glider manufacturers um, and you know there's Wills Wing and one other small company. Um, in the years before 1980 there were as many as a hundred manufacturers of sufficient size to at least advertise in the magazine um, and really um, in, in 1977, there were 10 manufacturers in the U.S. that were larger than Willswing. And all these companies were producing new models every year. Um, so um, there was a lot going on. It's hard to condense hang glider development into, into a neat timeline. But, you know, essentially by 1974, you had mainstream standard gliders. These are um, generally no battens or maybe one batten. Um, it's what everybody pictures a hang glider of. It's a, you know, two lobes of, of sailcloth with an 80 or 90 degree nose angle and three spars, equal length spars. 18 foot leading edge, 18 foot keel, and you know, 80 or 90 degree nose angle. That evolved very shortly into um, higher performance standards, cut keel standards. What people started doing was shortening the keel so it became higher aspect ratio. Um, um, the problem with that is, and they started tightening the sail to reduce the twist. Um, and that led to problems with spinning um, and, and, and longitudinal divergency and other issues. Um, that got, um, so there was the standard, the cut keel standards. The next milestone in development was um, the radial roach tip where the tip cord was extended um, to reduce the tip stall problem and to move um, you know, some twist out, out to the tip. So by the time we got to 1977, from 1974 we all had standards, 1977 we all had these higher aspect ratio gliders, comparable in aspect ratio, yeah, pretty much in 1978 we had a 7.5 aspect ratio glider with, and now our current high performance gliders are, are, are lower aspect ratio than that. Um, so three years from this to a glider that has a similar type plan form to my modern gliders. That's the evolution. So 1977, we still have these single surface gliders with, um, without defined battens, um, without, without de a defined airfoil. Um, so that evolved in the next couple of years. By 1979, we have well-defined battens, aluminum battens defining the airfoil. We have more double surface in the sail, and we have cantilever leading edges. Because these earlier gliders, to support the, the long spars and the big wingspans, they had deflexors. This is like kind of imagine a sailboat, all the rigging on the sailboat. We had those supporting our leading edges, all these cables out there supporting the leading edges. So we had um, from 77, to 79, we got rid of all these cantilevered wires. We had double surface, we had thick bat, fixed battens, and the glider that kind of put it all together um, into put all the components of, of all that development into one product that worked 
well with the UP Comet. Um, and what's, what's interesting about the Comet is, um, and I talk to Roy about this all the time, um, there was nothing new about the Comet. All of the design elements of the Comet, the double surface, the fixed battens, the plan form, the airframe construction, it had all been done before. Um, but none of those products flew right. Roy put it all together in a product that just flew great, performed great, was safe, and it, um, it just really, um, and of course, everybody copied it, um, and that, that was probably the most significant glider in my mind in, in, you know, in hang glider development history. So, okay, so in, in 1980, we have the Comet, um, and then, you know, progress still continues um, with the Comet. It's all incremental changes, building on these, you know, on, on, on you know, the attributes of, of the glider before. I mean, we're flying these gliders, we're changing them, and at this point still, new models are coming out, like, every year. The, the product lifetime of a, a glider is like a year and you come out with a new glider. So probably the next big um, development was 1984 was the HP glider. That, that was our product. Um, and the HP, um, um, there was an HP1, HP1.5, HP2, HPAT, but the HP glider had some significant um, 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 innovations in it that again had been done much like the Comet, but it, it all came together into a glider that had demonstrably better performance than its competitors. And to give you an example, I mean, in, uh, I went to the world meet in Kosin in 1984, and um, there were either seven or 10 other manufacturers that produced copies of the HP-1. That's how popular it was. In fact, um, Steger, one of the um, European manufacturers, even called his glider the HP. And it was an exact clone of the glider I designed, except to economize on fabrication, he used the same diameter tube for all the spars in the glider, which meant the keel was way too strong, the crossbar was way too weak. The leading edges were exactly the same. Um, but yeah, the HP was extraordinarily successful and went on to set all sorts of you know records for um, distance records following that. Um, 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 Larry Tudor had had the first 200 mile flight on the on the Comet, um, and then the HP started notching it up 230, 250, 270, and until eventually with the HPAT, Larry Tudor flew 300 miles, another big milestone.